Thank you both. Uh, thank you, Patrick. I, uh, I feel privileged to be working with you and uh, to be able to share this space with you here tonight. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, uh, as uh, Patrick has before me, the traditional owners of the land we're on, the Gadigal peoples of the Yoran Nation, and pay my respects to the elders past and present. And to add to that, to acknowledge other of my colleagues and teachers who are here tonight, Sarah Madison and Daryl Cronin of Iptru, uh, Steve Atkinson and Lee Gassner of of Rios, uh, John Sanderson, and also Gita Bellin. So thank you all very much for helping me get here tonight. Uh, as Patrick said, I've spent the last 20 years working on addressing complex social challenges of different sorts, uh, climate change in my home country of Canada, health care in the United States, judicial impunity in Argentina, child malnutrition in India, violent conflict in Colombia, unsustainable food systems in Europe. And in, in doing this work, one of the key patterns I have observed is that complex social challenges tend to get stuck. And this observation has, on the one hand, uh, disturbed me, and on the other hand, uh, energized me. And I've spent the last 20 years attempting, I would say with much trial and much error, and much learning uh, to work out why it is, uh, why this is, and what it takes to get unstuck to create forward movement on complex social challenges. And these are the subjects I'd like to talk about tonight. Uh, the answers that I've come up with uh, have to do with, with power and love. And this immediately raises two problems for me. Uh, the first of the problems is that uh, these words have other connotations. I was talking to a friend of mine from a very uh, um, well-to-do family in, in Manhattan, and I told him I was writing a book entitled Power and Love, and I could see from the expression on his face that he was genuinely alarmed for my, uh, for my future. He said, Adam, you've, you've chosen the two words which are not discussable at polite dinner parties. <laughs> and I, I thought he was joking, but then I was corresponding with a colleague in the Dutch government, and I found every time I sent him an email with power and love in the subject line, it was uh, stopped by the government spam filter. So. <laughs> the second reason this is difficult, which is more fundamental for, for this evening, is that these are very common words, and everybody has an idea what they mean, which in practice makes it uh, difficult for me to communicate the particular meaning and the particular definitions I'll give tonight. So I invite you to take your understandings of power and love and to suspend them, to hang them on a string, if, uh, if you will, uh, for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. You may find that your understanding is unchanged by what I'll say, but you may find that you see these, uh, these phenomena differently. Okay. I uh, spent the first two weeks of December 2009 in Copenhagen participating in a minor way in the United Nations negotiations on climate change. And for somebody who's interested in processes for addressing complex social problems, this was like being right in the middle of the Olympics. Uh, Copenhagen was filled with people working in every different way on uh, the challenge of climate change. There were concerts and church services and uh, conferences, exhibits, films. It seemed to me that on every street corner there was a, a one or another demonstration and literally on uh, every billboard there was a message about climate change. Uh, 50,000 people participated in the NGO gathering, the Klima Forum, and in the first week of December 100,000 people marched through the streets of Copenhagen at the same time as hundreds of thousands of others were marching through the streets of hundreds of other cities, I, I guess including Sydney. Uh, I spent every minute I could in the Bella Center, which was the venue for the official UN negotiations. Uh, it was filled literally to capacity with 20,000 people, government negotiators from 192 countries and business representatives and NGO representatives, media people, staff, all networked with each other and with their constituencies around the world. Every day there were hundreds of negotiating sessions and formal and informal side meetings. Uh, much to my surprise, uh, 
uh, I didn't know what to expect. I uh, uh, witnessed a meeting of, uh, of greater seriousness and scale and sophistication uh, than I'd ever been part of or had ever, uh, ever even heard of. It, somebody said it was like being in a class where everybody was interested in the subject matter and everybody had done all the pre-reading. <laughs> the core dynamic that I observed in the Bella Center and in Copenhagen as a whole was a collision between two different camps, each with their own distinct drive and discourse. And I'm not uh, referring here to the, the, the camp of the people who wanted rapid movement on climate change and people who didn't, or between rich countries and poor countries, although certainly uh, that, uh, that collision existed. I'm talking about a collision that, in my opinion, is more fundamental. On the one hand, you had what I uh, would characterize as the power camp. You had the governments of Australia and the United States uh, Canada, other industrialized countries focused primarily on how to preserve their own position and their own competitiveness. You had China, South Africa, Brazil, other industrializing countries concerned with their growth and their sovereignty, uh, African countries, other poor and uh, vulnerable nations concerned with survival and development, and you had a whole cast of oil companies and windmill companies and shipping companies concerned with their growth and their profits. And the discourse of all of these different actors, uh, different parts of the power camp, uh, everybody, what everybody's discourse had in common is that it was all about each party's need for development and growth and self-determination. At the same time, you had uh, the other side, which I characterize as the love camp, both in the Bella Center and in the larger scene of Copenhagen. And the love camp was perfectly represented in the opening ceremony on the Monday morning of the first week in December. You had the Danish climate minister, who was the chair of the negotiations, emphasizing that the negotiators had a historic responsibility to each other and to, to humanity. You had the head of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the scientific body, talking about uh, global um, ecological imbalances. You had a film that was made for the conference which was about the lives of children if climate change was not addressed and the ethical uh, problem that that presented. And finally, the final part of the opening ceremony, you had a Danish adult choir uh, singing beautifully in a way that opened the hearts of everybody in this huge hall. The discourse of all of these different members of the love camp was all about interconnectedness and health of the planet and of humanity as a whole. Now, these two distinct drives and discourses produce, not surprisingly, enormous complexity and consternation and conflict. And the two camps were radically polarized. The view of the power camp was that the love camp was being impractical, even unrealistic. And the view of the power camp was that the love camp was being uh, sorry, I've said that backwards. It doesn't make sense what I just said. The power camp's view of the love camp was that the love camp was being impractical, even unrealistic, and the love camp's view of the power camp was that the power camp was being irresponsible, even oppressive. Now, where we left things on the final day of the second week of uh, December and where we have things now is both camps are strong. Neither of them is going to go away. And the reason is that the power camp can ignore or deny the importance of interconnectedness and the health of the whole, but ignoring and denying interconnectedness doesn't make the interconnectedness go away. I spent uh, quite a bit of time in Copenhagen with a friend of mine who's a climate scientist, and he just kept muttering under his breath when he'd hear these negotiations. He kept saying, you, you can't negotiate with Mother Earth. So pretending that you're not interconnected doesn't mean you're not. And similarly, the love camp can deny or ignore the importance of development and growth and sovereignty and say these things don't matter, but that doesn't make this drive go away. Sitting in the back of the negotiating hall, several times over the course of the, the two weeks from the very first session to the very last session, the most, uh, some of the most touching and telling moments is when a man named Ian Fry, uh, an Australian national, but who was there uh, representing the country of Tuvalu, would raise his hand. Tuvalu is a, 
country of uh, 26 square kilometers, 12,000 people. The highest point in Tuvalu is only 4.5 meters above sea level. And there were several times when, when Mr. Fry would raise his hand and say, I'm, I'm sorry, I just, I have to say something here. If we keep going the way we're going here, uh, my country will cease to exist and I, I cannot remain quiet. The collision that I witnessed in Copenhagen, I think of uh, this collision between the power camp and the love camp was a collision of an irresistible force with an immovable object. And the climate change situation then and now is poised between breakdown and breakthrough, between being stuck and moving forward. And the question that I was left with and am left with is what will it take to move forward on this complex social challenge? But then when I when I thought about it and thought about my other experience of the last 20 years, the conclusion I drew is that Copenhagen uh, is an extreme example of what is in fact a universal phenomena and that the collision between power and love often produces breakdown and stuckness and there is a more general question here about what it takes to move forward on such situations. It really wasn't apparent to me at the time, but when I, when I think back over these experiences of the last 20 years, I realize now that I've seen this collision between power and love many times. I got started in this work 20 years ago. Uh, I was working in London for the Scenario Group in Royal Dutch Shell, and we unexpectedly had a request from a group of activists in South Africa who wanted to use the Shell scenario methodology to do strategic planning for the transition away from apartheid. These were people associated with the African National Congress. Uh, Shell had been subject to a boycott in North America and Northern Europe because it had refused to divest from South Africa. So they were very happy to oblige uh, in supporting uh, an effort of the left. And as I was the youngest and most expendable member of the department, I was, uh, <laughs> I was dispatched uh, and facilitated what became known later as the the Montfleur scenario exercise. The Montfleur scenario exercise was not, it played, it made a contribution to the transition, but from my perspective, what was so important about Montfleur is it gave me a window into a way of working that I, uh, that I didn't know existed. And there were in fact many such activities in South Africa at the time, all characterized by stakeholders from across uh, the particular system in question coming together to say what's going on and what can we do here. And I was astounded by this way of working, which I'd never heard of, didn't even know existed. There was a joke people used to tell at the time in South Africa that faced with our unbelievably complex and difficult uh, challenges, we have two options. We have a practical option and we have a miraculous option. The practical option is right now we all get out of our seats and down on our knees and we pray for a band of angels to come and sort this out for us. <laughs> The miraculous option is that we continue to talk to one another and find a way forward together. <laughs> and what was such a surprise not only to foreigners but in fact to South Africans themselves is that this version of the miraculous option uh, eventuated and uh, to me this demonstrated uh, uh, or proved that under certain circumstances we can move forward on our most complex social challenges and I, I tried to understand uh, why that was. If I think back now, uh, what I've seen in South Africa both then and over the past uh, 20 years, I emigrated there in 1993, I can see the same collision between a power drive and a love drive. One way of understanding the last 300 years of South African history is through a power lens, this constant migration of people from different parts of sub-Saharan Africa, from the UK, from the Netherlands, Migration, colonialism, apartheid, armed conflict, peaceful resistance, negotiation, all involving uh, we want this, you want this, how, what's, how is this going to work out? Um, and at the same time, what the reason the South African um, transition so caught the imagination of the rest of the world is a very strong love drive. As you know, the word apartheid in Afrikaans simply means apartness. So the end of apartheid was simply the coming together of that which had been separated and the two emblematic figures of the, of the transition are known because of their attention particularly to this coming together of the parts. 
Desmond Tutu, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, with his emphasis on healing and reconciliation, uh, and, and uh, Nelson Mandela with his capacity to reframe the part as the whole, the most famous example of which is this uh, incident which is the subject of this new movie, Invictus, where uh, the, in the 1995 Rugby World Cup, the sport which was most identified with the uh, white Afrikaners was through a amazing uh, gesture reframed as uh, a sport of all South Africans. So somehow, somehow in this context, power and love managed to be reconciled uh, in some way and this is what produced the miraculous solution. And it was this experience in South Africa that has led me and my colleagues to, to, to try to replicate this South African forum approach. What would it be like if uh, leaders from across a given social system who shared a concern with what was going on in that system but didn't necessarily agree on anything else or like each other uh, or, 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 or want to be with each other, what would it be like or how is it possible to facilitate such uh, cross-system teams to, um, to work together? And this is what uh, we've been doing all over, the, all over the world with executives and politicians, uh, generals and guerrillas, civil servants and trade unionists, clergymen and artists. And I've seen this at, at these, at these, in these different national and regional projects, this collision between power and love over and over. Now, I realized that I had seen this collision between power and love not just at the global level, like in Copenhagen, not just at the national level, like in South Africa or Colombia, but, uh, but in all the organizations I'd worked with, whether it's Shell or the NGOs or government departments or companies with whom I've worked as a consultant, or even in my own organization, Rio's Partners, that there's this constant tension between the power drive every department, every individual, every unit wanting to get on with their ideas, their initiatives, their job, and a love drive, whether it's friendship or teammateship or common purpose, and that it, many of the most common challenges of management are about how do you reconcile these. And finally, finally, but uh, in a way most importantly for my own understanding, I have noticed exactly the same collision within myself that I feel very strongly this power drive, this drive to be myself, to do my thing, and at the same time, this love drive, this drive to connect and to be in communion of other, with others. And if I reflect on my own daily struggles and my own biography, I can understand it uh, uh, in large measure as the story of the conflict or the collision between these two drives. So, what's going on here? There's some phenomena that, uh, a phenomenon that I can see at all social levels, global, national, organizational, personal, what's this about? And uh, here's how I've come to understand what this is about. What I've come to understand is that what we're talking about are two basic universal human drives. And uh, here I've come to rely on the definitions of a man named Paul Tillich, who was a German-American Protestant theologian. I'd never heard of him before I came across his book, Power, Love, and Justice. And I use his definitions not because I have any particular allegiance to German-American Protestant existential thinking, uh, but because I find his definitions have enormous explanatory value. They really help me understand a lot of these situations that I have uh, that I have been dealing with and I am dealing with. Tillich defines power as the drive of everything living to realize itself with increasing intensity and extensity. The drive of every living thing to realize itself with increasing intensity and extensity. The simplest image I can give of power as Tillich defines it, have you ever heard of this NGO movement called guerrilla gardening? So guerrilla gardeners are people who sneak about at night in a city like Sydney. They, they look for a vacant lot with, uh, with, with concrete over it and they put seeds on the ground at night because they know that the seeds will break through the concrete and at least have the potential 
to create a little green space. This is a perfect example of the drive of everything living to realize itself with increasing intensity and extensity. And this is what I saw in Copenhagen with this discourse of development and growth and self-determination. Tillich goes on to define love as the drive towards the unity of the separated. The drive towards the unity of the separated. And he's using his terms very precisely. He doesn't mean the drive to join up things that don't belong together. He means the drive to reunite that which is whole, but which, ha which has become fragmented or which appears fragmented. And this is what I saw in Copenhagen with this whole discourse of interconnectedness and health and wholeness. Now, working with these two drives in theory is simple. It's in theory you can, conce or conceptually, you can imagine how you could achieve, how you could work simultaneously with the drive to self-realization and the drive to reunification. But in practice, it's difficult and dangerous. And the reason it's difficult and dangerous is because, as everybody knows, power has both a generative side, a side that can build things up, and a degenerative side, uh, a side that oppresses. And the other reason that it's difficult and dangerous is because, as not everybody knows, love also has two sides, a generative side and a degenerative side. And it's at this point that I look around and the women are all going, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I got a lot, uh, I had a, um, a, f uh, a colleague once from Texas in a class I was taking, and you know, Texans have this wonderful way of talking, and his son had just been to the Netherlands and had fallen in love. And uh, when his son, he said, when my son came back from the Netherlands, he was so in love, he wasn't worth shooting. <laughs> and this is this image, the kind of love which, which leaves you completely, you know, d unable to do anything at all. I got a lot of uh, criticism from my colleagues for putting a grenade and a rose on the cover of my book, but the grenade is an excellent symbol of degenerative power, and in this sense, the rose of degenerative love. So uh, let me give you a, the starkest example I can where I first saw these uh, two sides of power and two sides of love. Uh, in 2006, I was invited to work in Israel um, by a colleague of mine. Uh, he had been involved for many years in uh, Jewish-Palestinian dialogue, but he thought that what would be very useful would be a dialogue amongst Jewish Israelis. You may know there's enormous conflict within Jewish-Israeli society between settlers and people within the pre-67 borders, religious, secular, left, right, uh, native-born Israelis, immigrants. And the, the thesis of this project, of this dialogue, was that until Jewish Israelis could have some common understanding of what they were trying to do, they'd never be able to make peace with their neighbors. Now, when I got into the project, the two sides of power seemed very uh, obvious to me. You know, I understand the story of the last 60 years of Israel being a story about the drive, uh, the drive of uh, the Jewish people after the near extermination of the Holocaust to realize themselves with increasing intensity and extensity. Spiritual revival, linguistic revival, territorial expansion into the settlements. And it also seemed obvious to me that if the Jews were trying to realize themselves with increasing intensity and extensity, and ex on exactly the same real estate the Palestinians were trying to do the same, that it wouldn't be surprising that there would be a conflict and reciprocal degenerative power. So I could, two I could see the two sides of power in the macrocosm, and I was interested to see that immediately when the team got together, this team of leaders from all these different factions, the same two sides of power showed up in the microcosm. Any of you who've ever worked with or facilitated Israelis will know that they tend to say what they think, not a lot of deference. They make Australians look positively polite. <laughs> uh, very horizontal society. And I remember after a particularly uh, difficult session, one of the women came up to me and said, Adam, I know I'm being difficult, but I'm not willing to compromise who I am just to get along with everybody else. So this is power. This is the drive of everything living 
to realize itself with increasing intensity and extensity. And if everybody in a group of 36 people is doing the same all the time, then it's not surprising that there would be uh, difficulty and conflict and stuckness. What took me longer to see was the two sides of love. And the way I saw it was that uh, the schedule of the meetings, uh, because the meetings involved members of parliament, the Knesset, uh, and we had to uh, not interfere with the weekly schedule of sitting of the Knesset, uh, we scheduled the meetings from Thursday night to Sunday afternoon, which meant all the meetings took place over the Sabbath. And as the team was about 50% religious, it meant we couldn't work on the Sabbath. And there's a lot of things you can't do on the Sabbath. You can't write. You can't you can't use computer equipment. So my first reaction as the designer of this process is, uh, oh my god, what a disaster. We're having 36 hour workshops, 24 hours, where you're not allowed to do anything at all. <laughs> and it turned out I was completely wrong. That without exception, these 24 hours of Sabbath rest were by far the most productive uh, part of the team's time together. This, this ability to rest and chat and pray and eat and go for walks, you're, you are allowed to argue on the Sabbath. Uh, we're, in, we're really when the time when the team came together, and that's when I saw this love, this drive to reunite the separated, which had in fact been the original motivation for the formation of the project. And yet, and yet, um, the uh, the non-religious Jews uh, found this religiously organized unity to be confining. They said, "This is." This is not my unity. Uh, the, I, I do not define the group of which I'm a member of uh, in religious terms. And the story of that, uh, of that project, which I tell in my book, was a story of a gradual rebalancing, a gradual ability to work with both power and love, and in this way to become more fluid and more creative uh, and more influential in the system as a whole. So. The question that this leads me with, these two sides of power and two sides of love, is what makes power degenerative rather than generative? It is the absence of love. And what makes love degenerative rather than generative? It is the absence of power. Martin Luther King Jr. was a student of Paul Tillich, and one of his final speeches he said, what we need to realize is that power without love is reckless and abusive. And love without power is sentimental and anemic. It is precisely this collision of immoral power with powerless morality which constitutes the major crisis of our time. Now, uh, the main biographer of Martin Luther King Jr. is Taylor Branch, and Taylor Branch talks about King's life as uh, involving walking on a narrow path between recklessness, uh, between power without love on one side and uh, love without power on the other side. And uh, what I realize is a very accurate and helpful image is this uh, Greek myth of Odysseus, or the story of Odysseus sailing this narrow um, Straits of Messina between these two monsters, Scylla and Charybdis. Scylla on the rocks, this six-headed beast with these, uh, uh, these terrible teeth. If he, if he sailed too close to, to uh, and then on the other side, Charybdis, this terrible sea monster with a, uh, a huge mouth that created a whirlpool. This is the origin of the phrase between rock, rock and a whirlpool. And when uh, the story is that as Odysseus tried to get away from the rocks, he'd end up in the whirlpool. When he tried to get away from the whirlpool, he'd end up in the rocks. And this is what I think the challenge is of steering between power without love and love without power. Now, in theory, this is simple, but in practice, it turns out to be difficult and dangerous. And in many cases, our societies, our communities, our organizations tend to be dominated either by power or by love. And this means they tend to be characterized either by recklessness and abuse or by sentimentality and anemia, either ending up on the, rock, the rocks or the whirlpool. Choosing either power or love is always a mistake. When we choose power or love, we get stuck. And if we want to get unstuck, if we want to move forward in addressing complex social challenges, we need to do both. 
So the last part of what I wanted to say is, is, is to say a few words about how. How if the essential challenge is to not choose either power or love, but to learn to employ and indeed embody both power and love, how do you do that? Now the difficulty here is that most of us are more comfortable either with power or with love. You've got your power camp and you've got your love camp. In a calm lecture theater like this, it's easy to imagine how we could employ both power and love. But under stress, most of us revert either to power or to love. My own personal uh, pattern, which uh, is exhibited in a very high pressure project in India, is that I was reckless and abusive on even numbered days and sentimental and anemic on odd numbered days. The challenge here is that power and love constitute not a choice but a dilemma. Choosing one or another is always a mistake. And the, the image that, that I have come to, and which is the, the main image in the second half of the book, is that it's like walking, like walking on two legs. You need both legs to move forward, but that doesn't mean you need to move them both at the same time. Um, and uh, nor do you always have to be in balance, but you can move forward by employing first one leg, then the other. And I think this is what it takes, at least to learn to employ both power and love. If we choose either power or love, that's like trying to move forward on one leg, we fall down. If our power exceeds our love or our love exceeds our power, we stumble. And when we can use both relatively well, uh, we can move forward. How do we build this capacity? I think that there is actually a, sim a simple, although not easy, recipe. Step one, become aware that you have both capacities within yourself. The power people need to dig deep and find the love drive within themselves and vice versa. There are many inaccurate analogies here, but an accurate analogy would be to find both the masculine and feminine within yourself. Second is to work on strengthening your weaker drive. For the love people to work on strengthening their power drive, the power people to work on strengthening their love drive. And this is important because what the typical mistake is the people who are not so comfortable with love, they say, well, I'm not going to use a lot of love, but I'll, I'll also hold back on my power because I wouldn't want to hurt anybody. Or the people who, who don't want to use love say, uh, sorry, the, the power people say, well, I'm not too comfortable with, sorry, I always get this mixed up. But the, the, the recipe is not to reduce to your weakest capacity, but find a way to learn how to use 100% of your power and 100% of your love. And finally, uh, to practice, simply to practice putting forward one leg and then the other, and neither to choose between them nor confuse them nor, f nor fuse them. And the counterintuitive part is the way to learn this is not to try to do them at the same time, not to try to conceptualize what is the perfect uh, merging of power and love, but how can I exercise one and the other and one and the other so that they intersuffuse within myself. Why do we hesitate to do this? Why do we hesitate to step forward out of fear? The power people out of fear of being hurt, the love people out of fear of hurting others. I'll end with this uh, little story about, about stepping forward, not waiting until the fear subsides, but stepping forward in spite of fear. The final meeting of the Jewish-Israeli team was in Eilat, uh, which is the southernmost city in Israel beside the Red Sea. That's a little known fact, but my middle name is Moses, so I've always had a big interest in Red Sea stories, Moses stories. I'm uh, standing beside the window of the conference center looking out at the Red Sea, and next to me is Shlomo Pappenheim, an 85-year-old ultra-Orthodox rabbi. I say, uh, uh, Reb Pappenheim, do you, do you know any stories about, you know, what do you know about Moses and the Red Sea? And he said, well, you know, I, I have been studying it 12 hours a day since, for 80 years. I, <laughs> I know a thing or two about it. He said, let me tell you the real story. You know, there's the story and then there's the real story. So the real story is that when the Israelites were fleeing from the Egyptians and they arrived at the Red Sea, it was not parted. It was the water was full. And what did they do? They sat down on the banks of the Red Sea and they cried. They cried for 
their department head or their prime minister or Moses or God to please do something for them. And uh, the story goes that there was a young leader whose name was Nachshon. I, I love that this was a story of a young leader. And what did Nachshon, uh, Moses himself had no clue what to do. Nachshon, the story goes, stepped into the water. It said he stepped into the water up to his neck. I love this image. You can imagine what, what courage it takes to step into the water up to your neck. And uh, uh, Rabbi Pappenheim said to me, we think that it was the act of stepping into the water which parted the Red Sea, the act of stepping forward. So in trying to move forward on addressing our complex social challenges, I believe that we all face this Nashon choice. The terrain is uneven. There is no map. There is no path. We have to use both of our legs. We need to put one foot in front of the other. Simply put, the only thing we can do is step forward. Thank you.